my name is Joyce Miller, and this is J.C. Holman, Chris Holman, his uh, publishing name is J.C. Holman on all of your books, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm basically here to interview him mostly about a book he wrote called um, The Devil is a Gentleman, Exploring America's Religious Fringe, um, as well as talk about his upcoming book and other work. Um, so thank you so much for joining me and sharing your wisdom and knowledge and work with me today on your busy schedule. Um, so I, you said that your, your first book was about chess. Um, yes. you recently published an interview, uh, a review of the television show, The Queen's Gambit. I did, yeah. Yep. And chess has also caught on as a trend during the pandemic yeah it was interesting you know that, that when i first wrote about chess it had been a long time since there had been a popular book about chess or a, a book mm -hmm. about, about chess aimed at a popular audience right and um uh and i went to russia to interview the kind of president of this small russian republic who um had decided to turn his little country into like a chess enclave and, oh he, my God. and he said that that he thought of chess as a religion. Uh -huh. So when I wrote about that book, when I finished that book, um, I then turned to writing Devils and Gentlemen, in part because I felt like, I, in a way, I'd already just written about a religion, this oh weird gosh. kind of cult of chess in Russia. And, and so then um, I turned my attention to sort of actual religion. Wow. Yeah. I didn't actually know that. So the, yeah. the Devils and Gentlemen came right after your first book yeah yeah this was my second book i sold it um after i finished my first book but before it was published what is the and name of your book about chess it's called the chess artist okay and is the scene in the queen's gambit where they are in russia at all related to that small town that you wrote about in russia no i mean so you know uh, uh, russia has been a kind of chess mecca for right. many many years and um, i knew at least yeah. that yeah, yeah like that's why they're that's part of why they're like really good at math and science they like are obsessed with yeah i would say like, like all eastern europe um, central asia that that they they thrive on on these these kinds of games these logic based games and um and so you know the, it, 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 after the fall of the soviet union mm -hmm. um a lot of the chess of russia sort of vanished and this little tiny republic called Kalmykia decided to pick it up and they built a place called Chess City. And, and wow. so I went to Chess City uh, and, um, and that was the brainchild of, of this um, bizarre president of this little country uh, who had been a chess prodigy. And uh, he believed a lot of wacky things. So it kind of been very much lent itself to, he, he actually believed in aliens and stuff. So very, very Scientology-like <laughs> you know, as an adult. So, um, yeah, so it, it led very naturally into thinking about, you know, writing a book about religion. I didn't expect to suddenly become interested in your book about chess. I was only <laughs> mentioning it as an introduction, but now I'm wanting to know more and more. But now aliens are like in the news headlines, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like now totally it's like mainstream. <laughs> now it's, it's like really funny. the CIA believes in aliens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, there's, there, there you could. Um, think about that. Why, why is it that the CIA wants, seems to want the world to think that we know something? Right? I'm sure the truth about aliens is much more boring than the conspiracy theories. I think that's probably true. I think it's a lot of drama and activity. And, you know, and I think it's, it's safe to say that there are parts of the U.S. military that don't know what other parts of the U.S. military are doing. Right. And so that there's a lot of confusion there. And, and I think that they are content to have there be confusion out there. I think that, that particularly the CIA has that kind of in, in the history of um, psyops, you know, that, that playing around with ambiguity is, um, is, is something that they have found to be valuable. Well, I didn't mean to get you on the subject of aliens in <laughs> order to like discredit you or anything. No, so I, I, I hope I'm not <laughs> trolling by bringing that subject up. No, you're not. It's interesting that chess suddenly fell off the map after the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Is it, is it like a way of like 
undermining the intellectual culture of the country to try to like sabotage their their chess scene or am i just being paranoid no i, I you know the way that that you know even this little this president um had talked about it was that he was trying to use chess in his country the same way that world leaders will sometimes try to use a religion to create a oh, sense really? of cultural identity right wow. for for a society so you'll have like a buddhist nation or a christian nation or whatever wow. and and so because the soviet union was not religious they were an atheistic tradition wow. they um they didn't have that so so um chess became very very important as a kind of national pastime in russia right um and they considered it their their um, preeminence in chess was sort of evidence of the superiority of soviet ideas and um and so then when the soviet union fell all support for the game um, which had a lot of governmental support all that just vanished but it also seems like chess getting obsessed with chess is like a lot better than getting obsessed with other ideology right like you can yeah. only become so dangerous if your obsession is chess you, you you'll just get it get really good at chess right like you can't yeah. become a dangerous extremist based on your obsession with chess can you um or is it possible to radicalize a chess a no chess? i think i think that's a that's a good distinction right you know and, and, and you certainly you know i mean you are not in as as is the case with religions, you're not in danger of like launching crusades to wipe out all the people who who don't believe with what you believe. Right, uh, and you would have to warp some of the basic principles and ideologies of chess to take it <laughs> yeah. to a certain level. Right, right, right. But individually, you know, I think that this is also true of video games and games in general. That that um, there's a debate about whether these things actually confer benefits to people. Know, whether the white matter of the brain can actually be grown by playing certain kinds of games um and, and so that's why you see all these brain training regimes like lumosity online which I've read, and, and others and, and but the question is is at least on an individual level um does it also lead to obsession and to ocd kinds of behaviors you know that, that you become sort of preoccupied with you know, um advancing or getting you know getting you know I mean, that kind of leads you back to religion, to religions where there's often a kind of hierarchy of, um, you know, advancing through various levels of, um, you know, kind of sacred text and approval. Um, that's something you see consistent from one religion to the next, and um, uh, and chess certainly has that. You know, the chess rating, you know, you become a master, you become an international master, you become a grandmaster. You know, it means even something like grandmaster has that kind of weird sort of religious twang to it. It definitely you know? does. Yeah, yeah. There are some organizations that use that same title here in America. I've heard. <laughs> yeah, heard. yeah, yeah. You're, you're thinking of the JKK. I think yes. that, yeah, that's who it was. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. who it was. <laughs> we they definitely do that. Yeah. It's very Dungeons and Dragons. Right, right. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. chess is supposed to be good for cognitive development to a certain extent. I've heard. Yeah, and that may be true. You know, it's like it's it's not. You know, I, I don't I don't think it's been definitively proven to be true, um, but um, it's certainly the anecdotal evidence that people say. Okay, you know, this include, increases your you know your, your um, ability to solve problems. Strategic you know. thinking. Yeah. Delayed gratification, things I wish I had known as a child, but can still learn as an adult. Yeah. Hopefully. I think also, you know, kind of confronting disappointment too, because you lose games, right? Oh yeah. You know, how do you how do you um, how Lost. do you just kind of get past the 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 fact that you're you're not you're not perfect, you're gonna make mistakes. And so I think chess actually sort of teaches humility in a weird way. I started playing with my computer during the pandemic mm -hmm. and it's like the first time I've really played chess. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of a good way to start because they won't let you move the pieces on the computer in any way that they're not meant to be moved. Right, right. right. And like when I was a kid, I was really impatient and I would move the pieces. <laughs> like I would be like, oh, they each move in different ways. Like this is like, you're not going to learn this. And mm -hmm. the computer forces you to play correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. that's kind of cool. It was, I was, I was just in um, Union Square the other day and, and um, you know, when I wrote my book, I wrote about the chess players at Washington Square Park. And there was actually another park right below the World Trade Center, because the work I did on that book was before 9-11. Oh. And there was a big chess park down there. This was gone. 
Oh my um, gosh. And, uh, and then Washington Square Park was a big chess mecca, but it was, you know, back then it was, there was a lot of, there were drug sales sort of happening all around you while you're playing chess. Uh, and then a lot of them moved to Union Square. So right outside the subway station um, is, you know, kind of a whole bunch of chess players just set up all day long. And I was there the other day. It was amazing because the crowds were huge. You know, after really? King, after oh, King's cool. Gambit, you know, it just totally exploded. And now there's oh. huge groups of people hanging around watching chess games and stuff. And so it's, Queen's Gambit has just completely transformed the chess world. Wow. Yeah. Even, even there's, there's like that young, young, young M.A., young Ma, you know that rapper? I don't know. There's, yeah. a, there's like one of the famous lines from one of their famous songs is like, <laughs> chess not checkers ah, like we're playing yeah. chess now not right. checkers right, like right, right. we have to really strategize yeah, yeah like yeah. it's kind of coming into the zeitgeist as a right right, right. as like a valuable cool thing to be able to do sure yeah, yeah, yeah. applicable yeah. to life in many ways <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> just like a lot of cults also claim that they're right their applied knowledge systems are but yeah, yeah. um so as we know, I mean, you're going to publish a book soon, mm -hmm. The Anarchic Quest, mm -hmm. and um, it's not available yet. Uh, you're not simply, you know, writing the book. You you have uh, you're like heavily documenting your research efforts for yeah. the public. Is mm -hmm. that a website people can access now? Not yet. No, is that that okay. you know, that so this was a heavy, heavily researched um, uh, project that involved me as a creative writer doing a lot of the kind of work that scholars normally do in terms of going out and finding primary source stuff, not just trusting the work of scholars who published in you know obscure journals or whatever, but actually deciding to go out and do it myself. And um, so I wound up with just you know thousands of documents that people had not seen in 170 years for the particular story that I was writing. And, and so um, some of that is going to be in the book itself, images of those texts. And, and, you know, um, Do you want to quickly tell us what the Anarchic Quest is about? Sure, yeah. So, so Without the, forcing you to give yeah. away information before the book is actually published. Yeah, no danger there. Okay. <laughs> um, so the book is about um, a diabolical surgeon named J. Marion Sims, who is um, held to be the father of gynecology. And, and Sims is um, infamous for the, the experiments that, that really created um, his reputation and gave him that title. And these experiments were performed on enslaved women who couldn't give consent and were not given anesthesia. And this was between 1845, 1849. Um, and Sims' cure of um, a woman named Anarka, put cure in quotation marks there, just because it's um, that's part of the story, whether she was really cured. Um, that cure is more or less the birth of modern women's health. And that young woman um, is, you know, he's considered the father of gynecology. She's like the closest thing we have to the mother of gynecology. And, um, and so, you know, all women living today, you know, have a kind of debt that they owe to this young woman. And um, she was just lost to history. She vanished. Nobody knew what happened apart from what this guy said about her. And I found her. And I managed to recreate her whole life story with all of these archival documents. And so what I'm eventually going to do is what you alluded to. I'm going to um, not only tell the story in the book, but then also create a kind of online archive so that everybody can go and just look and see at the documents, the actual documents that reveal you know, what happened to her. And she was just this person who was mentioned in his accounts and a lot of people knew she was mentioned but everyone was like well where's the evidence of her right you yeah. can't wh where are the records of her yeah so what was the moment you discovered evidence of her like what was that so um yeah so the, the, the all that was known about anarcha was what this guy had said about her mm -hmm. and um, he controlled her story completely in the same way that he once had control over her body. And, uh, and nobody really doubted that, you know, or even the people who were criticizing him, the only source they had to go on 
was, was simply what he'd said. And what was odd was that um, nobody had gone looking. And, and so the experiments took place in Alabama. Uh, so as soon as I heard about it, um, I went to Alabama and um, I went to a place called the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And I was looking in the estate materials of the plantation that she was said to have come from. And, and it was in there, you know, uh, really not that long after I started looking that I, that I found her name for the first time. Um, after- Where did you find it? It was, it was in these estate materials. You know, it was in an 1828 estate inventory that oh was gosh. compiled uh, after the, 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 the patriarch of this family. Oh, so she was sort of listed as their property. property. Yeah. She was among their assets, basically. Right. She was the fourth of five children um, in an enslaved family, and um, uh, and their, this family was was valued together at fifteen hundred dollars, which was about fifteen percent of the total value of that plantation. Uh, and so you know, and and what had, what happened was that Sims had had um, left Alabama originally, and he came to New York, and he opened um, a place called Woman's Hospital here in the city. And, um, uh, and then I found her in those records as well, you know, that, that I mean, I found the original um, case record books for Women's Hospital, and her name popped up there as well. So then, you know, sort of what I knew was that she'd been experimented on further, um, that people didn't, and people didn't know about it. And um, uh, so, that was kind of the beginning, those two documents, one in Alabama and one in New York, um, and realizing there was a trajectory, there was a, a, a path that she had taken that people didn't know anything about. And, um, and then you know, I decided to, to uh, continue that search and figure out what had happened to her. And then you just followed a whole trail of records and documents that led to more and more, and yeah. people, people also, uh, participated in your, I mean, they were, people were other also participating in this effort. Like you were involved in a documentary recently as well, Yeah, right? Yeah, it was a documentary. What film, is that called again? Remembering Anarcha. Okay. Uh, which is, you know, sort of available to stream on YouTube. When did that come out? Like really recently? In May of 2021. Okay, so, yeah. and yeah. you can find it on YouTube in, in yeah. entirety? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I mean, the, the search for Anarcha was really went all over the country. It was in Alabama, it was in Virginia, it was in New York, I went to the Library of Congress. There was, you know, there was finding, um, you know, uh, pieces of her story in lots and lots of different places, and then beginning to sort of stitch it all together and figure out, you know, how did she get from here to here, you know, and, and, um, and sometimes that was like archives, sometimes it was in published papers, sometimes it was finding the right person who had a stash of documents in their house somewhere and, and combing through those until you find her name. Um, it was it was like an endless, oh yeah, it was an endless series of finding needles in haystacks. And it was just, uh, uh, it was it was exciting you know, to, to be part of that. And a whole bunch of people helped, you know, archivists helped, um, activists helped, art, you know, artists helped. There was, there was a lot of people who sort of recognized the value of the story and the work and, and contributed in one way or another. And, and so I wasn't alone, you know, in, in conducting that search. And, um, but it really did sort of, um, you know, pull her out of, out of this um, you know, oblivion because all that was known was a name and there wasn't any facts about her at all. And before that, you had published your piece in Harper's. Yeah, yeah. So what, when was that? So the piece was published in, in the fall of 2017, which was an article. Um, what is it called? Uh, the the uh, article is called Monumental Error. Okay. And it was specifically about um, Sim's statue in New York City after he died in 1883. Right. Um, a lot of his confrere and his, his, his colleagues um, uh, banded together and, and raised money to have a monument made and then erected in Central Park. And, um, and so I wrote an article, it was kind of a biography of that statue that really sort of deconstructed his legacy. And that 
statute had been controversial for about 10 years. And a lot of women's groups and black activist groups had been protesting it for quite a long time. I found out about it relatively late in the game, but um, nobody was really doing that kind of deep dive on the sky at that time. And, and so I did on that statue. Um, and then the article, um, this was for Harper's Magazine. I submitted, I sold it to them and then wrote it to them and they were kind of sitting on it for a long time. And then the white nationalist march happened in Charlottesville, Virginia in mm -hmm. August of 2017. Immediately after that, these women's groups in East Harlem, um, a group specifically called East Harlem Preservation, they staged another protest at the site of the Sam statue in Central Park. And this time it just went viral. And, and it created what a lot of people are familiar with, this period of 90 days when uh, Mayor de Blasio um, created a commission to reevaluate the, the city's policy on, on monuments. And, and so, um, you know, my article got sent around it, 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 you know, Harper's wound up publishing it kind of very quickly then, you know, when, when suddenly it was a major story. And, um, uh, and so, you know, um, at the end of that 90 day period, the commission was hearing, um, uh, you know, sort of um, commentary from, uh, from members of the public in various boroughs in New York City. And I went to three of those meetings and, and spoke to the commission. And, um, and then, you know, there were a lot of statues that were under consideration. It was Batane, it was Teddy Roosevelt, it was Columbus, it was all these monuments that, that were controversial. And the thing was, is that it never in the history of New York City had they removed a statue simply because people challenged what it represented or, or whether it was, it, was, um, uh, it was correct to have put it up in the first place. It, is just, it had never been done. And, um, and so the, the Public Design Commission, the body that was responsible uh, for all of these decisions, eventually they voted on Roosevelt or Patani Monument. And they voted to retain every statue in New York. And then the Sim statue, they voted unanimously to remove it. And so for the first time in the history of New York City, a statue was removed simply because of complaints over its content. And so it established a new precedent. And this really became a kind of important moment in um, the ongoing conversation about monuments in general, because Confederate monuments have already been coming down in the South. Um, but New York wasn't part of it yet. They'd already been coming down prior to 2017. Yeah. And yeah. in New York, you were like a cat, like your work wound up being like kind of a catalyst for this yeah. first statue in the whole. Um, I don't know if catalyst is the right word. I was, I was part of that. You were part of yeah. an effort. You were kind of on the, uh, what would you call it? The, the edge of the sword when it happened. <laughs> yeah. Right. The edge of the knife. Yeah, I wasn't the point. I was, I was the edge. You were on, <laughs> I was you part were of the blade. Yeah. On the blade. <laughs> yeah, right. Quite, quite on the blade. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, you know, I, th I think that, that um, uh, you know, there was a woman named Viola Plummer who um, was the first person to simply you know, print up some flyers and stand on a street corner in, in, in East Harlem and, and just start trying to generate enthusiasm for thinking about that. And so the whole story about that monument was really amazing because it just showed that that decision to just start handing out flyers can ultimately set a new precedent. So it was very much a like you can fight city hall kind of story. Um, and certainly in my, in my research, there was, um, you know, resistance that I encountered from the Parks Department, from the American Academy of Medicine, from, you know, the Department of Health, that they, 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 they didn't want to set this new precedent, you know, and, um, uh, and yet the pressure just got to be too great. Ultimately. It's mm. really incredible. I'm almost, I'm almost numb to the recognition because especially in the year of the pandemic, where I, and I'm sure others have been so bombarded by the internet as like a main source of like the spread of ideas. Uh -huh. It's like ideas are still spread on pieces of paper passed out on the street right. and yeah. actually cause change. Yeah. There are still paper records in people's houses and basements and archives that right. do contain new information that you do have to go and find. Right. It's, yeah. it's quite actually empowering to yeah. know that not all the information out there is simply floating around online. Right. You I mean, have to I, go do late work. 
Yeah, I mean, in that in the kind of research that I did, you know, I mean, I think people, particularly when they start to think about genealogy and that kind of, that kind of research, um, they start to think, well, you know, if you look on Ancestry, you know, well, if it's not there, it probably doesn't exist. And then what you realize when you actually go to probate offices, when you actually go to archives, that that there is, um, you know, that, that the Ancestry is, is like, the, it, it is to what is the available records, what Wikipedia is, compared to an actual encyclopedia, you know, it's like the beginning, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's some good stuff there, and it's valuable to have that um, as an, as an asset, but it's just the beginning. And it's just the beginning. Yeah. It's yeah. like a, it's just a rough spitball, but it's not going to have everything. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to throw any random uncredited anecdotes into the conversation and mm -hmm. like, you know, spark any weird conspiracy theories which mm. is so easy to do but someone did once casually mention to me that they had native ancestry native american ancestry and they took like an online dna test and it definitely didn't show it at all hmm, interesting huh. so i'm not sure what test they took but anyway that yeah. kind of frightens me i haven't taken a dna test yet in a while i mean i think that you know i mean it, I don't. I don't think like the DNA tests, you know, that are sort of commercially available. I don't. I don't think that would hold up in a in a court of law because, right, the chain of possession. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, you know, you don't know. I mean, they could have mixed. You know, for that person, they could have just mixed up their res her result with someone else's result. You know, and then how did you know? You, know, you wouldn't know. And so, right. think, you know that that you would need a, um, a much more expensive. Uh, probably, surely, yeah. You know, and, and something that would be. Uh, monitor right and you'd be really sure you yeah. want to talk to the person who's doing it right yeah. you meet in their office not just like send something in the mail yeah right. yeah right, right, right. um so all right well we met around 2016 mm -hmm. and it was i i'm pretty sure it was through joe pan millar yeah um i was just sort of beginning to recognize the aspects of a, of a of a Scientology satire I've written, and then you, that's how we started talking, or mm -hmm. I think, and then you gave me a copy of uh, The Devil is a Gentleman. Right. Yeah. And then we've just been great friends since. Yeah. Um, and so the complete title is uh, The Devil is a Gentleman Exploring America's Religious Fringe by J.C. Holman. So are you implying that Scientology is a religion or is, is this just sort of a loose title because Scientology is the topic of one of the chapters in the book? Well, you know, I, th I think that, that when, I was, when I was setting out to do this book, I wanted, I wanted you know, the, the parameters, there were eight different religions that were in the book. Right, um, and you explore them firsthand, personally. Right. You yeah. go out into the world. Yeah, yeah. You charm your way into these different religious groups and you participate in them and you write, write about them. Yeah, and that, and that, you know, the book is also kind of an examination of the life of William James, who gave us his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, which was, you know, a kind of survey of, um, of different religions from the 19th century. So I was following in James' footsteps. I was trying to use his work to kind of palpate the religious topography of America in the 20th century. And so I was looking at religions that emerged in the US uh, in the 20th century. And you know, and I, I tried to create a representative spread. There would, you know, there would be hundreds of religions that emerged in the US in the, in the, in the, in the 20th century. Right. And I was thinking about them the way that you know, ethnographers and religious scholars you know, uh, define religion. So that's a big category. So like, you know, religious scholars will look at like corporate advancement centers and recognize, well, that's a kind of religious structure. And um, I looked at organized atheism as a form of religion in my book. So there was a lot of different forms of it. And Scientology, you know, there, there were some, some religions in my book were really benign. I, like, I, I thought Wicca was really benign. There was a, a monastery in upstate New York that I thought was very benign. And Scientology was really sort of the villain of my book. You know, so they, they were they were the ones that I did kind of undercover. I just sort of showed up, let them pull me in, and then chronicled the experience of of uh, what it's like to just get pulled in. Right. Yeah. And were they the 
villain to you because you had some pre-existing understanding of like their spying tactics from from reading about them in the news like do you think if you hadn't read anything about them mm -hmm. doing those things and had just walked in would it have seemed as villainous well you know, you know i mean i did it i did it in a weird way you know when i actually had my kind of real life experience of it i went in cold you right. know i i grew up in california and so I was seeing, um, you know, kind of commercials for Scientology when I was like six, eight, ten years right. old, and we like these commercials of weird exploding volcanoes and stuff. And I, and I had no idea what it was, and um, and and so you know, I did a little tiny bit of research when I when I was writing my book proposal, um, but I kind of wanted to go in cold because I wanted to have the experience of someone who just, you know, they, they I mean, Scientology. They have their you know, testing centers all over, right. and they just stand outside of the street. And they they, try, they literally try to pull people in, you know, with doing you know e-meter tests and stuff. And, and I just I just I wanted to get the the experience of that kind of person. But then later on, you know, I did I did my kind of deep dive into the history and the books, all, all the books by the debunkers, and and, um, and so you know, in my book, there's this you know, kind of bouncing back and forth between the voice of me as a kind of being relatively naive, wandering in and, and I'm experiencing it for the first time. And right. then, you know, so spliced together, you know, with, um, you know, some very, uh, um, you know, from, from later date, having really studied everything you're talking about. Right. So yeah. when, when you had gone in to try the services of the Church of Scientology, had, had you known about, had they been, had, had Operation Snow White even been like publicized at that point or had, had had their spying activity against Paulette Cooper even come out at that point? The Paulette Cooper thing I did learn about eventually. Right? Okay. But, After but you it had been a, yeah, it had been a while. So this was like okay. two thousand and three. So right. the Paulette Cooper stuff was in the eighties, right? right? Right. And and so um you know the fair game thing. Yeah, really sort of seemed to have worked for Scientology, right? You know, after Hubbard died, and, and after Ellen Hubbard died in 1986, I think, okay. and, you know, and uh, David Miscavige took over, um, they kind of just went dark for a while. You know, there wasn't a lot of press. You know, the, the Lawrence, it was Lawrence Bright, right? He had the big book, Going Clear. Yeah, that was yeah. very, that was relatively... That was recent. recently, yeah, like yeah. 2014, yeah, 2000, something like that, yeah, around that year. And Janet Reitman did a book, which I actually reviewed when it came out. Um, and you know, and there and there have been documentaries, and, mm -hmm. and, and um, but when I decided to go and do what I did, there really yeah. hadn't been, you know, a major major coverage for quite some time. Right. And and so um, uh, it was kind of sort of fresh territory. It felt like it was. Okay. And. Um, and so, you know, eventually I learned about Paulette Cooper. Actually, I got really scared then, you know, because I'd already done it. I'd already gone and joined, and, and I was getting, you know, kind of crazy phone calls. And, you know, and after I after I went and joined for a couple of weeks, um, you know, then then um, I forget. I, somebody contacted me online. It was sort of, you know, early. It was pre Facebook, but it was somebody contacted me online, and, and she was this very very beautiful woman, and, and she said. Be very, be very wary of beautiful women coming into your life suddenly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> was that your first uh, experience with a honey trap? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, got, I guess so. I guess that's what it was. But they lost, they lost interest in me pretty quick. You know, and so you know, I got, I got kind of harassing phone calls. Overtly, oh, anyway. Yeah, as far as I know. Right? As far as you know, I think <laughs> yeah. honey trap is a very important term for journalists to know about. Right. these days right sure although yeah. it can go very wrong if yeah. you start just accusing random people who yeah, yeah reject you of being a honey trap but um yeah i mean I, I did freak out a little bit when the book was um going through its legal review you know when it was being published yeah and you know that the lawyer who was assigned to it one of the first things that she told me was that she has two good friends who are scientologists mm -hmm. And I was, and she was sort of a freelance. I think she was a freelance attorney. She wasn't like an in-house. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I freaked out. I called my editor. I was like, "We can't have this person doing the legal review. She knows Scientologists. That doesn't make any sense." And and, huh. and at that point, you know, what I knew was was the Paula Cooper story and 
Paulette Cooper was, you know, sort of viciously harassed and they, right. they framed her for a bombing, right? There's no, that was, that's what that was. It, yeah, um, there, uh, I read The Unbreakable and the Slovely by Tony Ortega. Huh. I wrong, but I mean, I should read Paulette Cooper's actual book. Yeah. I just really like uh, novels about, I guess, terrible surveillance activity against people. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. But I think they tried to uh, forge her handwriting in order to frame her for a bomb threat against Henry Kissinger, and she was very nearly incarcerated or institutionalized. And I think she was forced to see like a psychiatrist right. for like a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. because of that. Yeah. I mean, and I, I didn't really know much of that when I started. When I started it, and I learned it on route, and I was having like these conversations with my editor, and you know, and um, uh, you know, I I think that um, because I was telling the story, I wasn't necessarily like aiming to do an expose. I mean, I certainly right. did in terms of Hubbard's bi uh, Hubbard's biography. Your tone is very, yeah. it, it's it's very academically and um, intellectually you know fair-minded it doesn't right. seem you're not out to make religions look like things that only stupid people participate in right you know right yes yeah. it's, it's very you know well-rounded intellectually yeah i mean ultimately you know scientology became a scam right you know it's it's it became a kind of a corporate shell game and and um and you know and, and but I think that its earliest incarnations, when you know, when Hubbard is just this, you know, kind of struggling sci-fi writer, you know, I think that um, he was trying to find a way to cure himself, and um, and he did um, early on try to have his ideas about the mind accepted by the the the, the scientific community, but. It was it was kind of ridiculous in its way. It certainly didn't fit in with um, the kind of mainstream thinking about um, about the brain, and so he was rejected by that. So then he just sort of went off on his own, and then and then Scientology just kind of evolved and, and wasn't even um, wasn't considered a religion at first. Um, but then ultimately the church, mainly because um, they wanted to avoid taxes. Um, sought to get the status of, of a religion, right? So then they would be tax free. Um, but ultimately, you know, um, Scientology was a, a kind of therapy scam. You think it? You think it's become like a scam in full, or do you think there are some people who, for whatever reason, somehow mesh with Scientology and they would be like way worse off, and there would be no weird cult for them if it weren't for Scientology? Well, I, yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, I, I think that that in the same way, you know, people can wind up having like a, um, that their own sort of personal spirituality manifests in, say, yoga. Like you know, how that guy. Or, or going to a chiropractor. Chiropractor right. is an, another interesting one that, that what chiropractors do emerge from a religion. Like religion's right. kind of completely gone now, but, but the therapy of it sort of survived. No and, way. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it was called something like chiropracy or something. I had no idea. Yeah. It's so sort of like how yoga in America, people have like completely right. divested it of its, yeah. of its original intent, but they're like, hey, this is a great like sort of mind-body science right. to a certain extent. Yeah. But I had no idea about chiropractic. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. It's it's the same story really, and and um, you know, and I think you know one of the differences is you know like yoga was genuinely like a new thing, right? You know, and maybe even in whatever chiropractors are doing was genuinely new too. But what Scientology did was sort of take, you know, stuff that was happening, whether it was sort of Freudian psychoanalysis or, or kind of stuff from the mind cure movement or Christian science, a, a lot of those kinds of things were, were sort of doing um, what Hubbard ultimately claimed to have invented himself, right? Really? Yeah, and so he was he he was completely lying about saying that that all of this just came from him. And I, I thought he sort of says like, oh, you know, it stands on the shoulders of all the philosophies that came before, but it but but like Scientology and dynamics synth synthesize all the old religious and philosophical ideas in ways that they've just never been applicable 
until now. Right. I mean, like, we're the yeah. technology, even though not all the ideas are like 100% original. Yeah, I, I think it changed, you know, over the course. There, there was that period when, when Hubbard was allowing that there were a number of kind of sources, Herbert Spencer, William James was listed among some of the original source material for Scientology. Uh -huh. um, but ultimately, you know, when, when Scientology went sort of um, full nutso with, you know, the, the volcanoes and the things, I mean, it, all, it all just became received wisdom. It became something that was supposed to have only come from Hubbard himself. Huh. And you know, and, and that was you know right. that was sort of the apotheosis where he becomes kind of this godly figure. He's no longer he's no longer just a prophet, like somebody who comes along and says, "Well, I heard a voice or whatever." But now he's mm -hmm. he is the source of wisdom, not the vehicle for the wisdom, but actually the source of it. Is it because at a certain point Scientology determined, or their leadership determined, that we have to um, embed ourselves into a bureaucratic vehicle in order to preserve ourselves as an organization. So they started, you know, becoming adamant about copyright and harassing the IRS and right, right. getting religious tax status because they felt if they don't, if they don't become a bureaucratic monster, yeah, yeah. they won't be able to preserve their technology. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think that that's, that's applies much more broadly than just Scientology. You know, when, when religions kind of emerge from, you know, these, this, this sort of individual who has a revelation and then starts to acquire followers, you know, when that person dies and then it gets passed on to the next generation of believer, mm -hmm. what happens is that the church, if it is a church, um, becomes a corporate entity. Right, and it has to have a different kind of series of, of values, and, and um, you know, you need a you need a leader figure rather than a savior figure, and and so um, uh, it all it all starts to change, and then the church has to figure out how to protect itself, um, uh, you know, and 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 become something more like a corporation, and I think that Scientology certainly better than any other religion of the 20th century, um, demonstrated that movement from, you know, from total obscurity to becoming a kind of corporate behemoth. You know? um, if you look at, at, at something like the Swedenborgians, um, Emanuel Swedenborg was a, was a kind of Swedish mystic uh, in the 18th century, I think he lived. Uh -huh. and, um, and he created a religion. And, um, and they are they thrive today. There's there's a lot of Swedenborgians um, in um, near Philadelphia, and mm -hmm. they they tend to keep it quiet, you know. Um, but they and I think it's because they're not a scam, right? I think that oh. there's a genuine belief system. I mean, if you look at the things that that Swedenborg was talking about, he was talking about you know human beings living on other planets in the solar system, whatever. And Swedenborg was one of those was one of those people who was trying to figure out how to reconcile Christianity with what science was beginning to reveal about the universe, that there were other planets, that the sun was not the center of the universe, that we were not the center of the universe. And so um, Swedenborg was positing not that there were aliens, uh, but that there were human beings who lived on other planets. And so the Swedenborgians have you know, some pretty strange tenets, or they did at the beginning, mm -hmm. but now they've become um, you know, a relatively benign group that keep that that stays very quiet, um, but like Scientology, they're also quite wealthy, uh, and, and they don't and they don't have a um, they don't have a therapy. They're not a therapy religion. You know, they just have a church. They have a community um, that that uh, um, you know that, that is thriving. It's not like it's uh, uh, and I just don't think it doesn't it doesn't have you know like all the problems that that say. Um, that Scientology does with the idea of their various orgs and people being sent to, to work there and accusations of slave labor and, and you know and all that they don't have that, and you know. But well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. But you know, I mean, it's 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 you know what what happened with Scientology. I mean, compare that to the Catholic Church and this and the sex abuse scandal and the way that the uh, the Catholic Church, um, you know, fought to cover that up, right? You know, and and really protected itself like a corporation. Right, and the Catholic Church in building these huge cathedrals, they were, it was all about demonstrating the wealth 
of the church because that would draw more adherents and you'd grow bigger and, you know and, right. and, and so you know and this was something that william james had had written about this you know why personal religion like an individual's like you know um experience of whatever they consider to be the divine that this he wanted to say well this is benign this is good but when that transforms into this corporate entity right. that's when it becomes bad you know and so hence really? that's that's why you know that the scientology wound up sort of being the villain in my book right and to become this corporate entity do you it's not you don't you think a religion can survive in this modern world without without doing that certainly to the extent that you hear some of the higher up abuses happening yeah. in scientology yeah, yeah, yeah those aren't necessary to build an organization that's right, just right, yeah that's just power on them up right yeah. i mean we think we think of cults people being you know yeah. put in a form of, sort of solitary confinement and right yeah, cut yeah. off do yeah. like those seem very extreme yeah i think perhaps scientology would argue these are things that all power organizations eventually have to do in order to establish themselves is to yeah. have spies and make people cut off anybody who's trying to stall their progress like right, right. that's sort of the justification like all successful and powerful organizations take these measures in some at some point on their journey their rebuttal can often be well the, the catholics had the inquisition right yeah you know yeah, yeah, and yeah. like we we've had way less casualties in our rise to power than any any single other nation or organization right right i mean i, I think that that's the the best analog for scientology is probably mormonism Right, you know, but but Scientology is just like a hundred years younger uh -huh. than Mormonism, and you know, Mormonism has got you know the the multiple wives thing. They have their blood oaths thing. You know, if if you leave, it used to be the case that, and there's been books about this. If you left uh, the church, they could hunt you down and kill you. You know, and and um, and that was part of the agreement of joining. I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't answer that. I just okay. know that there was this blood oath, mm -hmm. and and you know, and and so so Mormonism has you know um, moved away from from that, obviously, and and in the in the same way, Scientology um, uh, is 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 much less overt in the application of fair game now. They seem to have recognized that they got to play a public relations game now, right? And and so you know. Um, I'm I'm absolutely sure that they're 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 doing things to try to protect themselves. It's actually written into their sacred documents. You know, I've I, I've I've wandered into the Celebrity Center in um, uh, in L.A. and and you know you can just walk in and on the wall you know is is the sacred tenets of Scientology and it and it says you know I think that you you know this it says that that you're obligated. If right. you perceive someone attacking the church, you are obligated to respond uh, by attacking them back, you know, or or you know, or even doing it preemptively if it means protecting the church. Now yeah. I'm curious, depending on the personality of the church leadership and the personality of the person interpreting that sacred text, one person might feel attack them in return means writing a strongly worded facebook post <laughs> right, yeah. but another person might interpret attack them in return as hiring private investigators right. for ten thousand dollars a week to follow you <laughs> around and ruin your life for right, right. decades mm -hmm. i'm wondering do you think things like that are very open to the influence of the personality of whoever's interpreting it. And it could be that if the leadership was a totally different psychological profile, it wouldn't be such a villain. Right, yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, as, as the case with, say, Christianity, Christianity went through this long period of, of being essentially a kind of obscure um, cult with lots and lots of peculiar beliefs, right? And then you have, Paul, who comes along and really transforms Christianity 400 years after Christ, mm -hmm. and and it and it becomes a very very different kind of entity. And I think Mormonism has that too with Brigham Young, who's not just Smith, and you know, and, and 
you know, so I, I think, you know, um, in, in Scientology, you know, has, has sort of seems to have moved away from the slap suit mentality where they were very public, you know, and at, at Hubbard's command that, you know, he said something like, we should use, <clears throat> you know, we should, we should, we should sue for slander very publicly just to discourage attention from other sources, right? right? And this is very, you know, this is, this is like the, the, um, uh, the kind of the, the basic template of the Trump organization. Right. I have been sort of just sort of waiting for some journalists to figure out that Trump actually read like Scientology org materials or something. You know, it's like that his that that um, it's quite it's, possible. Yeah, because Hubbard and Trump are, are they're you know they're practically the same person <laughs> even visually. You know, it's like you know <laughs> right. But then you know, I mean, Hubbard's got oh, the kind of the chubby red hair looking thing, and you know, anyway, we don't want to try it, but, but it's. Um, uh, you know that that they're not doing that now. They are not doing kind of the aggressive public slap suits that are um, uh, designed to sort of prevent attention. You know, um, there might have been. You know, I, I think like when when Lawrence Wright did um, his piece for the New Yorker, mm -hmm. I think there was communication between the church and the New Yorker about that. Oh, you know? and you know, and and they they did not. Um, and I don't, I don't know that to be true. I think I heard that, so it's kind of very much a fuzzy rumor. Um, but um, you know that that piece was was you know heavily fact checked, and you know, and in in the old days, Scientology probably would have just tried to sue them into oblivion. Um, right. But that didn't happen, and and so I think that whatever Scientology is doing now is more covert and more subtle than than it used to be. Right, more covert, more subtle, possibly more integrated into into its contextual American liberal society. Sure, yeah, and I think that you know, I mean, this is this is the way that any major religion um, is going to wind up trying to protect its interests. Right, right? you know, they're going they're going to develop, you know, like I think doesn't Catholic Church have got they got teens of attorneys that are that are going to like be working on its behalf you know that that um uh, so so i don't think that's unusual i think that that you know something i wanted to get at a little earlier was was the way the way we distinguish what is a religion and what is a cult right, right? now you know religious scholars don't like the word cult at all because it's so stigmatized and we tend to think of cults as being small right, right? but i don't think you know that, that isn't the way i approach it in my book and and I think that um, cults, for my money, discourage individuality and discourage creativity. And and so I wouldn't I wouldn't say that Christianity or Catholicism, even though it has all these other problems of being a big right. corporate entity, I wouldn't say that they necessarily do that. Right. But I think Scientology does that, which is weird because they're they're supposed to be about the artists good is for the most revered game on the planet. Yeah. 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 You know, we help artists right, remove right. the barriers right. that are holding them back. Yeah, yeah. Artists attract suppressive personalities. Like, yes. yeah, yeah. right, there, there's a sort of uh, one hand giveth, the other taketh away component right, to right. the ideology about artists. Yeah, so, but, but I think that, you know, at least what I saw um, was ultimately a kind of move away from individuality, move toward conformity. Right. Not necessarily giving people the opportunity to be creative, and you know, and it might be depersonalization. You know, yeah, I mean, I think it's, a, I think Scientology is a very different organization if you're Tom Cruise, right? Than if you're a member of the Laity, or you know, it's like, you know, that that you know that there's a, it's kind of a service industry thing. There's there's a whole group of people who are more or less in support of of right. these high level theologians or right. you know, whatever, you know, and. and um, and that's and that's creepy, you know. And, right. um, and it's it's and I, and I think it all emerges because it all just emerges out of ultimately nonsense. It, there wasn't ever a kind of earnest revelation that gave birth to you know something that people believed was going to be good and true and important. You know that that what you think of when you think of more benign religions. 
Hubbard, it was, it was, you know, he was trying to find a cure for himself, and then very quickly, even way back in the 50s, early 50s, right. it just became a scam. Perhaps a cure for a society that needs to be able to embrace the high achieving individual without exploiting those who are aspiring to some level of achievement espoused by a capitalist nation mm -hmm. so that they can eventually maintain some type of upward mobility. Right, right, right. Especially given that it was kind of forged in the age of paranoia against communism. Right, yeah, that's important. And a paranoia towards the corrosion of American ideals. Yeah, yeah. Do you think Scientology is a, a less harmful way of creating creating and exploited labor pyramid schemes than others? <laughs> Do you think that if we all aspired to Scientology, we could all move up the bridge and eventually <laughs> become immortal spiritual beings achieving our full potential without any barriers holding us back in the in yeah. the vast universe or do you think this is just a dis a dystopian um disaster waiting to happen um well you know, i mean one thing i thought about when i, when I was writing it and you know I, I called um you know uh, scientology and, and then and then i was looking at the work of julian james um, and Who you started also that chapter. mentioned in the book. Yeah, yeah, and he had a book called The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Yes, the yeah. Bicameral Mind. Yeah, yeah. What and is that concept? Well, the Bicameral Mind um, was, you know, was that there were just sort of two halves of the brain that, you know, they're, 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 they're I'm not explaining it very well, but, but that um, the brain had only evolved relatively recently in human history that prior to about 5,000 years ago that human beings had two hemispheres of the brain and the corpus callosum had not really fully evolved yet and and so that people were functional what is the corpus callosum it's the this sort of the the kind of very very thick uh connecting tissue of neurons that mm -hmm. that, that is between the two hemispheres of the brain you know, oh. we're, we're kind of all you know familiar now with the idea of the left people who are left-brained and right-brained. Okay. And there are these, these left and right hemispheres of the brain, and between them is the corpus callosum, and how those, how those hemispheres communicate with each other. Okay. And so James essentially said, well, that corpus callosum wasn't there, you know, and, and that people were um, hence um, functionally schizophrenic up until about 5,000 years ago. And, and that these, these um, that you could be fully functional, right? That uh -huh. you can create societies. And, and um, but that your brain would essentially have to communicate with itself. One side would talk to the other, and you would perceive that as a voice. Right? You would be hallucinating. So yeah. there was a lot of magical thinking. Literally. Or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. There was a lot of hallucinating. Yeah. Personification of. Yeah. Yeah. Some the rift between the. Right. It's not the same as the subconscious and the conscious, right? Or is the exactly, bicameral right. mind an early model? No, 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 it's 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 different than that. And you know, and that's the and that and that was the thing that kind of connected it back to Scientology for me. Because ultimately it was a totally new mm -hmm. theory of the mind. And um, and it was it was not falsifiable. It wasn't really like a legitimate scientific thesis because it couldn't be proved true and it couldn't be proved false. Right. It was just something in which you had to have faith, which is why it made sense to sort of consider it in this book. So the bicameral mind is sort of like we're functionally schizophrenic back when yeah back when we did not when our corpus callosus was really just not that developed. Right. And we're kind of like you know you get information from the non-literal part of your brain or something um and you yeah. go i saw it you make connections that aren't there to sort of explain yeah. the information yeah. that you're trying to yeah. use to survive I mean, basically like what we would now call self-consciousness or what we would now call interior monologue Right. Was something that we would perceive as actually an external voice. Interiority? Right. right. Yeah. That's a yeah. word that I recently 
encountered in an article about Margaret Thatcher in the New Yorker. Interesting. <laughs> and the article actually addressed how she had kind of a strange religious background of her own oh, and oh. almost no interiority. Right. Huh. Interesting. And I noticed in Scientology, uh, becoming introverted in yeah. any way is basically considered like an aberrated, non-functioning state. Yeah, yeah. You should be extroverted at all times, your attention directed outwards. Yeah. All knowledge is useless unless it is applicable. Yeah. Interiority is just a, a toxic, useless, meaningless thing yeah. in Scientology unless it manifests in maybe someone writing a short story or being an actor but nobody because Scientology and Dianetics have achieved all there is to achieve in philosophy and religion why would you want anybody to think of new ideas right it's right. not healthy right 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 it's yeah. not healthy to do that yeah and, that, and that's when you that's when you, you you move from having written something that is a like a, a book of science to becoming like sacred text right now it can't be questioned anymore, right it is it is the received truth it but it's the word right but it's not just don't question us the the right. principles are actually like like being being introverted in scientology introverting mm. going inwards having yeah. in having interiority having internal monologues is is yeah. just considered like you know you're aberrated from right, my right. experience yeah, yeah, in it yeah. Christianity isn't like that. They have prayer. Right. You're allowed to have prayers that no one but you and you know yeah. right. God hears. You don't yeah. have to then tell an ethics officer the content of your <laughs> prayers. Right, right, right. In case you were concerned that some content of your prayers was right. against the rules in right. some way. But to come back to your to your to your original question, you know, I think that that. You know, so you, the Julian James theory of the mind, you have, you know, uh, Hubbard's analytical and reactive minds and the whole idea of engrams that you can get rid of and all that. Um, and then you have like our version of the conscious and unconscious mind. Or if you listen to Freud, it's the, it's the, the, um, the id, the ego, and the superego, right? And all these different theories of mind, and that's all they are. And, and so are we all headed to the dystopia of Hubbard's vision of the analytic and reactive mind? And it's all going to look like, you know, is that the idea there? Well, on, on one level, you might you might argue we're already living in that. We're all just more comfortable with this idea that there's the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, and we should go in and talk about what our unconscious drives are. You know, all of that is theory, right? And and the difference is is that the ongoing study of consciousness is happening in, in science and psychology and, and it evolves and it changes and, it's, and, and that's good, right? I mean, but what Hubbard did is essentially borrow a bunch of stuff from that and then create his own idea of the mind and then say, that's it. You know, don't, there's no reason, right. as you're saying, there's no reason to think about it yeah, anymore. It's, it's right? pointless, it's unproductive, yeah. it's, it's toxic to try right. to come up with new philosophies. This yeah. is it. Right, right. Yeah. So that yeah, so but but what we're living with now, depending on you know if you're Freudian or not, I guess you know that that is that idea of the conscious and unconscious mind, and and you know and, and that is um, a theory. That's a different kind of theory, God, right? You know, it's like something we believe in that um, you know hasn't been. It's not like there's you know there's been speculation about where is consciousness, right? And um, and of course you know B.F. Skinner just sort of said, well, there is no consciousness and and just intuitively that doesn't sit well with many people I mean I think that as, as we sit here and think we feel like we're conscious right you know we don't feel like we're pigeons you know pecking a lever to get a pellet of food you know and, and uh, but that's essentially what behaviorism was as as a theory that there isn't really consciousness we're just sort of uh, automatic machines and, and um uh, but you know, all of these are are just different theories of the mind. And, yeah. Right. Well, now at least from the casual popular psychology and brand science articles that I quickly skim on the internet, mm -hmm. the ideas seem to be that certain thought processes become automatic, so sure. that we don't have to heavily like 
think about them too much. If we if we repetitively do certain things in our lives, we do kind of have like the the hamster and the yeah. in the and the and the reward pellet sure. mechanism happening because it's like you know that's how I get myself to to be on time. Uh, yeah. That's how I get myself to you know make sure I I eat breakfast in the morning or something yeah. like that. But it, it's it's just like we're starting to see like certain parts of our brains store information when we repeat them enough and then other other information is not stored long term or automatically in our brain because it's new or you know, yeah we yeah. just learn more more and more about the brain every day that really just is not covered in Scientology and dynamics and it's very useful information even on a practical level. Yeah, yeah. I mean I, I think I mean we're we're kinda of headed toward having a conversation about free will ultimately. Right, you know, is there free will or isn't there? And and um, uh, you know, and I don't think you know we're certainly not going to solve that. But I think that you know, um, what I ultimately argue in 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 my book is is that everybody's got a kind of religion in one way or another. Right. That that um, being a human being, being a self conscious individual means that you wind up having some kind of cosmological curiosity about the world. Who are we? Where do we come from? Why are we here? And, and essentially what I say is however you decide to address those questions is your religion. And e even if you're uh, the most curmudgeonly atheist with nothing but disdain for anybody with remote spiritual or religious ideations you are still without being able to help it creating a religious mechanism of your own right. somewhere somehow in order to function yeah now people who are <clears throat> who are really who are really suffering or, or are just not maybe not intellectually curious themselves um, are going to be really susceptible to something like Scientology because it's going to come along and tell you well here's all the answers it's all in this book Read this book. Look up these words so you don't get lost, right? And um, uh, and and Elrond will give you all the answers. And you know, and, and so you know, Scientology has got big outreach to um, you know to to former drug addicts and to people coming out of uh, uh, out of prison, to people who are lost, who are likely to be seekers, looking for community, looking for answers, and they get pulled in to that kind of pyramid scheme. Because he's 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 giving them, um, uh, or the 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 Elrond system now is, is giving them um, answers, you know. It's, right. And uh, and and that appeals. I mean, that's certainly what I saw when I let myself get pulled in, and I, the right. people I encountered, who I was in class with, right. that they were looking for the comfort of certainty. And right. and if you're not. In a, in a really bad situation or a, a transitional time of uncertainty in your life, which is often the, the profile of, a, of an easy mark for cult membership, they have techniques for um, finding your ruin, the, the, one, the one thing that you wish you could change, even if your life's pretty great, the, the one thing that you yeah. If you 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 would change if you could. Right. That's another way. They pray on. Yeah. You could be yeah. in a great situation. You could be like right. a millionaire. You could be a film director. But you're still thinking of that one woman who you <laughs> got away, or, yeah, or yeah, yeah. you're still like grieving the loss of your son, or yeah, yeah. or you 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 still get brain fog from you know that time you. You know, did LSD or whatever. I don't know, but yeah, yeah. who knows? I don't. Know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean, that's exactly what they did. You know? So when, when I when I joined, you know, I I, um, I just kind of walked up to these guys on the street, and, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I let them do the, the you know the e meter test on me, and and, uh, and then they walked me in, and I took the tests. There's right. Three different tests. And one's an IQ test, and one's like almost like an MMPI, you know, kind of, it's very long, it's got all kinds of Right, the per person, MMPI, what is it? The Minnesota Multiphasic Personality. Group. Right, right. You know, but it's that style of test. Yeah. And um, and then there was one other that was like kind of an association test. It was really quick. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you know, they, they, they gave me these tests, they, they, they went off and they scored them, right. and they come back and they've got this graph, right? right? And then they point to the spot and they say, I see your pain, right? right? And, they're, and they're trying to give you, you know, they're, while, while Scientology is decrying science and decrying psychology, right. they're trying to like play off of it at the same time and pretend like they've charted your pain and they can right. really see it. Now they have the answer. And right. now they sign up for this class and write us a four hundred dollar check. You know? Right. <laughs> and it's like so. Yes, it's Which exactly is relatively what cheap for what you're getting. Well, it was two thousand three dollars. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. But it was. But yeah, I mean, it's like you that. Can't that's put a price tag on your potential. Right. right. Yeah, that's what they would say. You know. And so, and so you know, I paid for that um, uh, that that initial course. But then, you know, as they tried to like sell me dozens of books, you know, right. I, I resisted. I pushed back. And, you know, it was, they were a little frustrated. Yeah, um, they're doing fine. <laughs> yeah, did you did you feel yourself actually getting sucked in? Did you do you, do you do you think now? You know, maybe if I got back into Scientology, I could um, I could. Well, you said you you did some auditing, and there was a motorcycle accident that you right. used. It really happened to you. You weren't just taking incidents right. from James's biography, yeah. which you also said you did to kind of yeah. create a persona undercover. Right. Yeah, but um. Yeah, you used that incident. You earnestly participated right. in the session. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted you know in, in all of the groups that I wrote about, and and just in general as a yeah. writer, as as a kind of literary ethnographer, mm -hmm. I feel like it is my job to both um, look at look at things with a critical eye, which is not necessarily to expose them, but to to analyze them, to bring a critical faculty to bear on what it is that I'm seeing and learning about. But also, I want to try to show a reader um, the world of a particular group or subculture, and I want to I want to show it to you the way they see it. Right. right? And and so, um, you know, uh, Scientology auditing is mainly people um, performing a kind of lay counseling. Right. Right. And you know, you, you you have one person who's being audited, and they're telling a story. But it's all through memory therapy. Yeah. It's not yeah. like tell me your. It's not. It's not like analyzing you to your face. It's like go over the memory of this right. incident that has. They don't use the word trauma. Right. Or charge emotional right. charge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you know, you're telling a story, and and the person who is auditing you will simply ask you to tell the story again. Right. And to be more detailed. Right, right. And to add more detail, and eventually, you know, you get to the point where you really can't add more detail. Right, and you feel that impulse to start to fill in the gaps. Do you right? think? Do you think some people in right, and you, you had a dark corner in your memory of the motorcycle accident, and you, yeah. you can't fill it in, and you may never fill it in. Right, but I think that the idea was that by layering in more detail. You are sort of like approaching your life the way a writer would write a fiction. And of course, L. Ron Hubbard was a writer of fiction. This is what he did. So it makes sense that his therapy would be based on the skill set that he had. Right. Right. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard for me, you know, that like, everything about Scientology is, is, is pretty scammy. Right. But the idea that two people are sitting and talking about important events in their lives and are, in our, are willfully attempting to explore and understand what happened. Right. That's not necessarily bad, right? Not you know, in and of itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, when, when you start charging five thousand dollars for a cheap piece of equipment <laughs> that is supposed to help you do that better, right? Now it's pyramid scheme. And it's it's like you said, um, you know, you're you could potentially a person. Receiving this counseling could potentially be tempted or swayed or blurred into filling in the details. They could they could just outright lie, yeah. Or they could simply delude themselves right. in the way uh, you know it's it's the impulse to testify, yeah, yeah. Because there's an approval system that comes with reporting wins, yeah. right? Yeah, and yeah. Um, and there's also the potential for you know. I saw Goody Proctor send her spirit out on me type yeah. of 
hysteria. The, the ethics of the church are supposed to, you know, prevent for that kind of thing. But, you know, when you, when you, when you get into other components of Scientology, which you said you noticed from like when you were studying, you mm-hmm. felt it was like, what, what was your experience studying there? Like your descent, it said something about like you were, it kind of dulls your, like the repetition of the, of the, of like the, the mo- being monitored in the course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, not, I mean that the, you know, was, I went in and I, and I saw the um, sort of original introductory video, right. you know, and, and then they showed it to me again and they showed it to me again. And I was like, okay, well, I've seen the video. And, and they more or less would say, well, the more you watch it, the more you get it. Right. And, you know, and the same was true of, um, of, you know, sort of reading Dianetics, you know, because my original right. course was to read the original book that, that really got Scientology going. You know, they just start to sit me down and they say, read this book. Right. And, um, and then, you know, it's that repetition of making you watch something again and making you read it again. Right. And it's like, no, it, the idea is, is that if you read it enough, you're going to start to believe it, that repetition. Right. I mean, the same way propaganda works. You begin to formulate a paradigm that this is the standard, and I, my, any inability on my part to internalize the standard just shows that I um, still have work to do on myself. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it says that unfalsifiable part, right? You know, it's, it's, it's right. like, it, it's, it is a... It's a, now it's a theory that can't be questioned. If, if you're if you're questioning the theory, it's a demonstration that you need the theory, <laughs> right? right? You know, and, and and so you know, right. and, and and I mean, and that is intellectually du- duplicitous, right? And you know, is 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 again, it's that that you know, what what is the difference between a benign religion and and a cult? Is is that that denial of your creativity, that denial of your individuality, your job is to sacrifice those things and simply accept another person's um, version of reality. Right. And, and I think that, you know, for a lot of people, that might be very comfortable, right? It just gives them the answers. Right. Why not just like internalize a whole system of thought that is for the most part not too terrible, you know? Yeah, they might heavily recruit you to join the Sea Org, but you don't have to if you're strong enough to resist the recruitment efforts. And as long mm-hmm. as you go through the right channels, like they're not going to fair game you. Right. As long as you right. like, like you, you know, by I guess by the, you know, by Scientology's logic, you are just like a very aberrated person with some stuff running in your reactive mind that you know, lets you function intellectually in some ways, but you go into the church and, you know, you, you didn't try Scientology earnestly, you tried it journalistically, and yeah. you're just, like, you're just too aberrated, or you failed or something. Right. You, right. you failed Scientology, this book is the product about, like, is the product yeah. of someone who has, like, you've beyond failed Scientology, right. like, you're so aberrated, you would go in there trying to write about it without telling them. I mean, and this, and this is like, you know, that a lot of a lot of the more evangelical religions, and I mean right. evangelical just in terms of it, it being your job to proselytize. It'd be your, your job to go out and get more people, right? You know, right. That, that some religions, a lot of Christian fundamentalist religions, have this idea that other people are doomed, and mm-hmm. they have to try to save them, the whole missionary movement. Of Christianity, going around the world trying to convert, um, you know, uh, um, you know, people from from non-Christian developing countries, right? You know, and, and that the feeling like that's part of your job, right? Um, you know, and I mean, it's that's not Scientology. Scientology is about pulling more people in so that that you know they that they get more workers, more money's coming in, and everyone gets a job then. And, you know, but I think people in the church really see it that they're helping people oh, yeah, and they're yeah, making yeah. the world better yeah because now they can deal with other fellow scientologists who are who want to be sane right versus like the aberrated terrifying world that doesn't apply scientology and is incomprehensibly 
just insane and doom about Scientology. Right. I mean, I, I, and I talk about this. The guy who gave me the tests and who takes me over to you know the, the kind of mother church to sign me up for a class, and you know, I believe that guy thought he was helping me. Right. Um, he was also going to get a commission. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and so you know, so it, right. it goes both ways. You know, I think it's uh, um, uh, and you know, I think that you know, Christian missionaries are probably, you know, that there's more of a sense of self-sacrifice, um, you know, but it's, it's kind of the same, the same sort of thing, you know, and, and, and this is distinct from, say, the religions like Judaism that don't in any way right. try to recruit people, right? right? In fact, if you try to become Jewish, it's, it's there, part of the tradition that they huge, talk about. a huge background check. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean, they're more or less. That's, you know, I respect that. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, that, um, you know, those were like, you know, some of the religions that I wrote about in, in my book were, were more like that. And, and sometimes they were very small. They looked like a cult from the outside because they were tiny. There right. only be 20 or 30 people. But they were celebrating individuality. They were celebrating creativity. Mm -hmm. They gave, you know, they were based on some wacky beliefs, you know, but they were um, uh, providing um, a kind of equanimity. For people who often, you know, needed it, had some kind of, of deep-seated need, and I didn't need what they needed, and their answer was not what I needed. Um, but it was hard for me to just sort of look at them and say, "You're wrong. You're stupid," right? Because they found their answer, you know, and and uh, uh, and it's fine as long as they're not, you know, proselytizing to me. They're not telling me I'm doomed. They're not. You know, um, uh, that that would be a more benign form that a religion could take. And what I found generally was that the religions that preserved a sense of mystery, mysterious religions, they were the ones that tended, to my mind, to be more benign. And the fundamentalist religions, the ones that were more literal, or, or the ones that that became corporate entities, were the ones that that struck me as being cult-like. Even if they were big, I wonder with with religions that that become hyper literal um, and hyper corporate and try to heavily regulate the culture of thinking and the use of their doctrines um, within their within their constituents mm -hmm. versus religions that don't regulate how their members process their doctrines. Does that just mean there's like way more diversity in terms of crazy people who can be walking around in the world with like kind of half-baked magical thinking ideas that come from their religion that even though they're not getting like heavily heavily thought policed by church leadership are still out in the world with like just strange ideas that they internalize and that they never quite manage to um like like is it if you're half-assing religion isn't that kind of also dangerous in a way or is it is it is it always better to have like weird ideas that aren't being heavily policed versus like at least weird ideas that you can identify as being from a specific source. Mm. Uh, well, I, th I guess I think you know that, that you know because ultimately I would say you know, when people say, well, what are you? What is your religion? You know, I, and I just say I'm a Jamesian. I'm a William Jamesian. You know, and in, in varieties of religious experience, um, James ultimately came back to this idea of variety. Mm -hmm. You know, that the varieties of religious experience is as much about religious experience as it is about the idea of variety. And how variety itself is a value and a strength, right. and um, and so if we look at another person and we say, well, they're half-assing religion, what I think we mean is that that for us it would be half-assing, but maybe it's not for them, right? Ultimately, you know, James, in in way that he thought about um, experience and truth, was uh -huh. was that everybody had to. Um, you know, sort of find their own way to um, the reality that worked for them. Mm. And, you know, and, and actually there's some of that language that winds up in, in, in Scientology. What's true for you is true for you. Yeah. And if you don't see me abusing you, 
how can you say that Scientology is abusive? Right. Yeah, right, right. Did you see it with your own eyes? Yes, exactly. You know, that's the problem is that it's not earnestly meant when Hubbard says it because you know what he means is what's true for me is true for you because everything I say is is, right. is the given word and you just need to accept the tech as they would put it, right? Or you know. what it can mean is what's true yeah. for you is true for you. You didn't research that news article, therefore it could all be lies. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But you know Scientology works because here you are in the course room. Right, right. But but um but I think that that it's an isolation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, but the whole, I mean, the whole idea of America is based on that idea of religious diversity, and that's one of the right. great, great ironies of, you know, um, the far right in America, you know, coming around to this argument that we're a Christian nation, right? Because even at the outset, you know, the people who were coming to America, mm -hmm. they were Christians, but they were Christians who were being persecuted by other Christians in Europe. Right, they so, were <laughs> huge yeah. fringe people. Right, right, right. So, so we just think of them as some... You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pilgrims, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ireland is a Christian nation too, but it's you have the Pentecostals and the Catholics killing each other. You know, and, and, and it's 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 a it's just amazing that um uh that argument because it, it, it really is you know very very short sighted and um and so you know I think that would be my answer to your question that um ultimately in keeping with William James the thing to be um looking for is um those religions that you know so so individuality creativity right but goes hand in hand with that is, is variety and diversity right? right you know so so to say come back to something like mormonism which you know at its original outset quite a long time ago mm -hmm. would not have had that right but it's like evolved so, right. such that now we can have mormons that are you know mitt romney on the one hand and harry reid on the other you know, like like right. there's a lot of diversity that's possible inside the Mormon Church, right? And and so and I think like Scientology is moving in that direction, but you know we're only one generation right. away from Hubbard. It's still David Miscavige, right. and, and so you know you need like you know probably three or four more generations. It could go so many different ways, right? Really, really so yeah. many. You just never know. Yeah, and I mean you know like I think you said in your book and is something I've heard before is that religion is a cult plus time mm -hmm. um right but i mean it's way more complicated than that but yeah, yeah. It, it, it's so hard to predict the way something will go yeah. yeah um yeah yeah like like how you i think you mentioned the heaven's gate group right was like a web design had a web design company at one point they did yeah 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 and then yeah i mean and I, and I, no you know, one saw that coming right yeah in an end you know, I, I looked at that kind of um, a joint conjointly with another UFO group in San Diego. You know? mm -hmm. uh, they were the, they were, this was called Unarius. And so right. they were the Unarians, and then there was Heaven's Gate. And, right. and I was doing this this research in, in 2001, was when I first like looked into these groups. Mm -hmm. And because the Unarians had said that the Space Brothers were going to arrive in right. 2001. So I thought, well, I'll go to their first meeting in 2002. Right. And see how they handle that. And you know, and, and, I mean, and, the, and the, wow. the answer to that is always, and there's been books written about it. Really this. clocked them. Yeah. Really <laughs> strategized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, the, the, the answer is always the same when a prophecy fails. We just say, well, we weren't ready. Right. So right. then it changes and it starts over and the clock starts anew. Right. right. And I mean, and of course, you know, I mean, Christianity's got this too, or Catholicism has this too, you know, that, that, that you will come again, right? You know, it's like the same basic idea. And, um, but, you know, the Unarians struck me as being um, relatively benign. They were this small group. Um, they believed some mighty stuff, mm -hmm. but they were a good community for people who needed a good community. Right. And whereas Heaven's Gate was obviously not a good community. I mean, this Marshall Applewhite was the leader of Heaven's Gate. And um, uh, and it ended as catastrophically as it, as it can, you know, when when a um, uh, when a when a religion defies individuality, defies creativity. Um, that's that's the stakes. That's that's you know when you're saying like Scientology can go in so many different directions. That is one of the directions it can go. Like Jamestown, right? You know, it's uh, I'm sorry, Jonestown. <laughs> but don't you think they're too organized and too procedural to just to become like a Jonestown or a yeah, yeah. Gate? Like, yeah. 
you know, they're not just like they have so many policies and bulletins. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, it wouldn't be something as that. That seems like uh, too messy. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I can see good. them forming like an army. Yeah, like I, mean, a militia I think I think what would seem under the wrong. Right. circumstances yeah i think i think what would likely i mean and, and mormonism has had histories of that those kind of splinter groups right so i think that there will be a a um, power vacuum when, when david miscavige either dies or steps down or whatever and uh there may be splinter groups right you know and then and then some of those splinter groups may go in in darker directions you think if yeah. he's so uh sort of paranoid that he's not grooming a successor there would be a power vacuum well i mean i think that could happen even if there is one because because, because the you know those those opportunities to groom a successor they don't always work they don't right. so somebody else could be gunning for the position yeah. they don't know about yeah yeah i mean he's got he's got to be pretty old now i mean he was he was in his early 20s when hubbard died so i think you know that's it's not going to be too long before scientology goes through those kinds of growing pains I guess Hubbard died in 1986. Yeah, I think he was like his early 20s. Yeah. So sure. he would be 61. He, I mean, he would be in his 60s or 70s. Yeah. So he could, you know, he could stick around. So pictures of him must be not recent. <laughs> yeah. Unless he's, he's just yeah. very young. Well, I mean, there's very a, well preserved. I mean, you know, he, he, he could have had a lot of work done too. I mean, they do have a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, right. cult membership is supposed to actually stunt your age, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's a it's an anti aging. Interesting, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's one one plus. <laughs> um, uh, Hubbard's. You say in the book, uh, Hubbard's teenage diary said, "All men shall be my slaves. All women shall succumb to my charms." Yeah. And at first, I was like, "Wow!" And I'm like, "Well." I'm sure a lot of, you know, a lot of teenagers could write that in their diary and it might be just sensationalizing something out of context, right? Like if a teenager writes in their diary, all women shall succumb to my charms, all men shall be my slaves. Do right, you think right. they're going to wind up being like some, some kind of questionable tyrant or malevolent leader later on in life? Or not know. necessarily. Hubbard was, was, you know, I mean, what you, when you go into like sort of, um, buildings like Scientology buildings you know there was there was this kind of glorification of, of a kind of you know an old sort of adventurous club vibe yes. right and safari hatted right right khaki right. yeah yeah khaki suited <laughs> yeah and so going along with that is is some very very early 20th century gender norms uh-huh but I think that you know and and um in in those lines, what I hear is adherence to. Um, I mean, so he was a teenager too. Right. Yeah. But it, but it's like he's taking in um, some of the early texts of the cult of positive thinking. Uh -huh. Right. And I'm forgetting that what was the name of that that. But slaves doesn't yeah. wanting all men to yeah. be your slaves doesn't sound like positive. No, well, that's no, not no. positive. No, I mean it's positive for him. Maybe for him. <laughs> right. You know. I mean, I think that's what that's what's meant. Not you know, everybody wants. Yeah wants all men to be their slaves. No, right. Yeah, he, so yeah, I mean, he's definitely a megalomaniac. Right. right. Who, you know. I mean, I look, I'm like, who would want slaves? Like that's, right. who would want slaves? Yeah, and that's, it was awful. And he, and he was, you know, I think that it got worse when he was narcissistic. You know, he, you know what, what he became later in life, you know, um, being this kind of hugely fat, you know, um, long haired monster living on a ship surrounded by young girls and halter tops and stuff you know it was it it you know it was very um, weird yeah i mean it was it was you know if 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 you weren't forced to think in terms of the analytic i mean the active mind weird. we would say here's a guy who's just totally indulging his age i mean that's <laughs> really scary yeah. i i i don't want to know i mean i i have not read a huge amount about the what were what were they called the messenger cadets the the, the young girls who would yeah be his... I there was a name for that troop or whatever but i mean it was all young girls right yeah. right yeah i mean i'm, I'm sure that i wonder was, if you know, he did things oh i'm sure he did 
and I don't know if there have been any, been any accounts yeah. that I've heard. There was, um, you know, one thing that they did make me take out of the book that I was so frustrated about because mm -hmm. I pulled it, I, it was from one of the debunkers' books, and the, the Scientology, or Scientology debunker books were all sued to oblivion. You know, that, that a guy named John Attack, uh, Ben Corbett, uh, these guys were uh, sued terribly for blowing the whistle. And um, and the books that exist now are the one that what's in them survived all those attacks. So you had judges who were looking through the book and saying, this is true, this is true. You know, and it has to stay in the book. And, and there was some stuff that was in those books that the lawyers nevertheless made me not put in, 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 uh, in my book. And one of the things was the, the policy of overboarding you know, when you would, you know, you're on the Sea Org ship and, and, um, and, you know, you would be punished for something and they would essentially tie a rope on you and throw you overboard. Yeah. You know, and, um, and that was, that was a real thing that was happening. I've read about, a I've read individual accounts of people who had that happen to them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the Scientology logic might be a moment ago when I said, uh -huh. Do you think he like did anything creepy with those girls? Yeah. That like those young girls who he basically sort of made into his different like to her. cadets. Yeah. Well, the Scientology logic would be like the fact that you are imagining that he might be like violating or molesting these girls in some way is a reflection that you yourself have like committed some crime of that nature or or maybe you just are so like aberrated. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe I've seen too many terrible things that like maybe he just really wanted to empower young girls. <laughs> Do you think that an old man in a religion could possibly have just wanted to empower these young girls <laughs> by making them into his messenger true? Right. But maybe not, but the halter tops. Why halter tops? Yeah. That was their uniform. Yeah. Why didn't he just give them, if he wanted to empower young women, because you can argue like these weird, like the culty, there's this weird cognitive bias in Scientology where like the militancy has a certain gender equality mm -hmm. inadvertent effect. Because now you have like lots of women wearing like these like faux military uniforms in like pseudo leadership positions in a church right like in you know in societal context there could be a cognitive bias of like um gender equality that kind of happens yeah, yeah. um which is a weird kind of side effect right. of these of this kind of totalist cult vibe yeah um and so part of me is like oh maybe maybe he just was trying to empower like young girls, but it's also like why halter tops as part of the uniform? Yeah. Unless yeah. it, unless it was like a honey trapping technique to lure in the lascivious sensibilities of the outside world. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just hope nothing yeah. happens to these young girls. Like, I hope Elrin. I hope he didn't like molest a bunch of girls. You know what I'm saying? Like. I suspect he did, you know, but I but I don't know. You suspect he did. I don't I don't I don't think I came across any actual actual accusation of that, but I think it was kind of more or less assumed. Um, but really, yeah, that's a big thing yeah. to assume, though. Maybe you know, but but you know, and and but I, th I you know. Oh my god! I mean, I mean I think that, that, you, that then it just gets even worse. Yeah. I mean, if he's like molesting. Yeah. Just I mean, like, and this and this is like you know this is more or less the standard thing with um, not necessarily re religion. So after I wrote my book about religion, I wrote my I wrote a book about various utopian experiments, um, which was a similar kind of kind of thing. You know, and if you look at like you know the, the history of the Oneida community in upstate New York, um, and you know which which gave us the concept of free love, uh, and and of course that was all about um, John Humphrey Noyes and that his um, uh, you know, they, he was scheduling sexual encounters for everybody that was part of this community, and he was, you know, assigning women to himself, you know, to, um, uh, you know, as his, um, you know, he would be the first father for, for women if they would, he would father children. Or look at David Koresh. You know, I think, uh, you know, David Koresh is, is, uh, is, a, is a 
fairly fair analog for some of the more covered ones. Um, you know, and, and but you know, he and he went really dark, and he was he was out on the sea work precisely because, you know, there were there were um, uh, you know um, uh, the law was trying to get him, and he was just like, well, if I'm always on a ship, they can't chase me down, right? You know, and it's like as insanely wealthy as he, as as Scientology became, he he was almost having to try to he tried to buy a country, you know, it was like, he more or less was trying to find a, a place where he could just make his own laws. And so I think that that a megamalai, megamalai, <laughs> megalomaniac um, surrounded by young girls and halty tops, you know, it's not, um, it's not too much of a stretch to figure out where that goes. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and everything about, everything else about him just sort of suggests that he, you know, he went, he went full Kurtz, you know, like a uh, heart of darkness, you know, he, he just sort of, you know, I think went native and, and indulged all of his you know, darkest impulses. Really? Yeah. See, that's what it seems like from afar, I, you know, uh, punishing people. I don't want to, I don't know. I, I wonder how you can have, it's hard to reconcile that uh, uh, image with the, the, orderly procedural bureaucracy but we know that those things are not disparate we know right, from yeah, other yeah. crimes being uncovered today that that carnal departure from civility and morality is still possible within the most Civilized, yeah, 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 of bureaucracies. I mean, this, you know, I mean, this this goes back you know, to a time when, when, um, you know, when it would not have been all that, or when, when it would it, it would have been less disturbing to society to hear about an older man and a younger woman, you know, thinking about like you know Elvis Presley, you know, marrying a sixteen-year-old and Paul Simon marrying a much younger woman, and these things were. You know, wildly accepted, and, you especially know. because of Elvis's Christian roots. Yeah, right, right. And um, but I mean, look at look at um, you know the the organization um, that went into the appetites of people like Harvey Weinstein and Jeffrey Epstein, and and, and people willingly become you know part of um, the cult of personality. Yeah. The cult of narcissism. Yeah. So it would be hard for me to believe that that didn't happen with, with Hubbard, though. You know, um, I don't think there's been any kind of hard evidence that that was happening. But, uh, so many people get away with those things and there's never hard evidence. Right. Um, that's a whole new level of horrifying. Yep. Well, um, I know we're wrapping up in just a, a minute or so. Um, you, you said that. You said that a, a sociologist told you that uh, religious biographies were almost always fictional, mm -hmm. and that apostates always lie. Yeah, I th which I thought was interesting, you know, because it, it in my that's anticlimactic on both sides. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, but, you know, but my my thinking, you know, in in reading the um, the debunkers' takes on Scientology was that they were working really hard to to really talk about what really happened to them and, right. while um, being harassed yeah yeah i don't know that this is necessarily true for for other religions but but i thought that you know like um some of the books i read that there was very careful documentation and um and so um uh i didn't necessarily agree with that particular scholar about this particular religion, though I think that um, he's probably right about um, you know other instances of it. He was speaking very broadly. Right, right. Uh, well, it's an interesting. It's definitely interesting thought to throw into the mix, especially from a so sociologist. Right, right. Um, and then you also mention. Um, you were beginning to think everyone is, is brainwashed in their own right, or no one is. Right. I mean, I was thinking about the, um, you know, the, the 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 connection from the word cult to the word culture. Right. Right. And you know, and um, 
you know, I was trying to get at this before, you know, that, that, that saying, okay, well, you know, Hubbard's analytical and reactive mind sounds wacky if you come from a world where we're comfortable with the idea of the conscious and unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just our culture, mm -hmm. right? And, this, and it, it, these are the beliefs that we have internalized. Um, you know, and, and I think it's Frederick Jameson who said that, that uh, you know, your ideology are the things that you believe without realizing that you even believe them. Right. Right. It's just you, you think that they're true. And they don't yeah. necessarily have words assigned to them, and then they may never. Right, right. So, so I think that that um, that you know that there's um, there is a way of, of 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 sort of thinking. Well, if you're a member of culture, you you've kind of been brainwashed by it, right? You have you have accepted everything it tells you about conditioned, perhaps. Maybe, yeah. I mean, that's or brainwashed. Kind of headed in the 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 the, uh, the behaviorist direction, right? But it's 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 um uh, it that but that idea of brainwashing, you know, is is not something that um, is particularly like well understood. They're not sure that that can even happen, right? Right. And uh, and you know, and it sort of goes back to the these basic questions about consciousness. What is consciousness? And um, how can you warp somebody's consciousness if you don't, you don't even know what consciousness is? And how can you be sure that that's what you're doing? Um, I think there's, there's just a lot of, of uncertainty in the science of the brain. Uh, and so I was just, um, uh, at that moment, I was, I was simply recognizing that there are a lot of things that people like me, who are relatively science-minded, um, who are, you know, I hope I'm rational and that I approach things with reason and logic. Um, but there are a lot of things that I just take as an article, as article of faith. I don't question it. Um, right. And because there's no time to fact check on a practical level. Right. Right. Or yeah. because you want to believe it. Yeah. Right. You know, so even something like, you know, this in, in science, the, the, the principle of causation. And I quoted, I quoted in, in this chapter from William James talking about how the principle of causation, everything, everything follows a cause, right? You know, there's always cause and effect, cause and effect. To sign on to that, um, and be assigned a science-minded person and to sign on to that principle of causation, mm -hmm. ultimately you have to go all the way back to a, a, a first cause, right? What is the first cause that then has an effect that then causes something else? You know, so that gets known as the prime mover. What is the thing that's that? And science is essentially postulating a prime mover. That's you know, so that's the Aristotelian concept of the, of the divine figure. But what is the prime mover? And so, if you're a science-minded person, without even really necessarily knowing it, you're adhering to that particular article of faith. Well, because you, I mean, our brains simply can't sift through all the information that's coming in our directions, yeah. in our direction, like religion, it, it's sort of, I mean, isn't it kind of like a, a roadmap of discipline and morality for most of society, for most of history, especially in formative years, isn't it sort of like your way of making sure you're caught up to the basic tenets of whatever, like of whatever your society is trying to do to like survive against the elements at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, and I think it, I think it could be a lot of different things for different kinds of people. I mean, I think that William James, in in his thinking about religion, is he came up with sort of two different kinds of people: the healthy-minded folk and yeah. what he called the six souls. Right. You know, and the healthy-minded folk were were people who just kind of wanted you know answers to be provided. Right. And you know, and so you know. Tom Cruise, you know, sort of bouncing on a couch talking about how happy he is as a Scientologist. That strikes me as being a very healthy-minded yes. thing, you know? Someone and, who's also trying to, yeah. to be that. Right, right, right. And, yeah, and, and, but the sick soul idea, it's not, it doesn't mean that you're actually ill, but, but, um, but that you can't just sort of blink out of your mind the darker parts of the universe, the darker parts of reality. And you, you can't simply then adopt someone else's point of view and, and, right. uh, and or adopt someone else's spirituality or their religion. Mm -hmm. you, you're going to have to like work through those things for yourself. And the answers 
for that kind of person are going to be different than the answers for the healthy minded Tom Cruise guy, right? And and so um, that goes back to that idea of variety. That what we need is a is a system not that that gives us some guy's notion of what um, you know how the brain is organized analytically. What, what instead is we need a system that that um, lets us um, appreciate and value variety in different kinds of belief systems. Right, and even possibly being able to switch between the times when you should be a sick soul and the times when you should be healthy minded. Like, sure. I, I don't know. I remember in the, or maybe that is not. What we're supposed to do like i i remember it in your description of the healthy minded versus the sick soul the sick soul feels they have to generally sacrifice in order to compensate for the wrongs in the world around them the healthy minded person shuts out information that is not serving them to basically complete or produce whatever task or product they're ultimately serving right, right. as a function. So it's like, yeah, the Scientology helps be more productive. And, you know, they like, don't read the news. The news is aberrated. It's just supposed to re-stimulate you. It's not going to give you any useful, like, new information that will help you change the world. Right, right. Um, you could condition your, you could use Scientology to condition yourself to be a healthy-minded individual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but what are you, what are you losing? process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't know i want though i wonder if like beck walks the line between the sick soul and the healthy-minded individual mm -hmm. because he's like a off-sided scientology celebrity mm -hmm. but i'm sure whatever he is experiencing that is not it's not really acceptable in terms of the interiority of the, of the healthy-minded Scientologist probably has to just go all into his music yeah. and it's on a subconscious level. Yeah. Well, it sure seemed like, you know, in looking at Scientology, like there, were, there were two different versions of the religion. You know, there was there was the, uh, the version for, for the Tom Cruises and the Becks, and, and, right. you know, and, and, and the opinion makers, right, right as, as Hubbard would put it in some of the administrative tech that yeah. we put out. Uh, and then there was the laity. You know, I mean, and, and religions always have... The peon. Tiger. Right, right, yeah, you know, or, or you know, in fancy religious terms, you would call them the theologians and laity, right? Mm -hmm. And there's that hierarchy, right? And and so, but in 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 Scientology, there was very, it seemed like one definitely served the other, you know? right? And and so, you know, on on, a, on maybe on some level, um, Scientology is, is is appealing for to different kinds of people in different kinds of ways, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Well. I'm sure we could talk about it for like a good two or three hours more. Oh, sure. Yeah. We'll have to continue another time. Me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I hope this helped to illuminate the upcoming work of, of JC Holman as, as well as his existing work that you can find. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know, Scientology watchers, if they haven't read this book already, would get a lot out of it. Hope so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.